Good morning. I think I, I just need a minute. I don't know if you've ever heard yourself talked about when you're actually in the room. It's a very humbling experience. <laughs> All right. The very fact that there are still great big holes on that mural either indicate, ugh, I don't know what I think about assessment, or what I think about assessment cannot be for public consumption, <laughs> or I'm not in the mood to play today. So whichever one of those three, it, your choices were absolutely fine. But be forewarned, you were invited to pick up a recipe card this morning, and you are going to be busy in the next hour, given the color of your card. So, just an FYI, if you don't have a card, there are some at the back, right around the area, the recycling area, and the key to your choices is posted there for you. So, assessment is like an ax. I can't do an entire, yeah, well, assessment is like a rope that gets all tied up in knots. Um, assessment, assessment is like a journey. Because when we arrive, and those of you who have children and grandchildren, you know we don't come fully packaged. We're not done the thinking, learning journey. So we have to kind of learn, gather information, acquire new ideas, test them out, reject them, adapt them as we're going along. So this morning I'd like to be thinking with you about assessment as a journey. And when you think about traveling, when you think about all that wonderful traveling music that we listened to when we came in this morning, Journeys are good things. Journey, with a journey, there's always a destination. But journeys always allow you or invite you to check the map. OK, the GPS, recalculating, recalculating. They offer opportunities for you to stop and fill the tank. And whether that's for petrol, or whether that's for the human tank, or whether that's just to stop and breathe and have a look around, journey invites us into those kinds of spaces. And sometimes on a journey, you just need to stop and think and talk to somebody else. And that's what we're going to be doing together this morning in the next hour, and that's also the reason you have a recipe card. Because at different places in our time together today, you are going to be talking to other people and gathering their ideas about assessment. Because I might be the speaker this morning, but I'm not an expert on assessment. And I don't know everything there is to know about assessment. The subtitle to today's talk could be Crocker's Crash and Burns along the journey, right? <laughs> And we've all been there. But the other idea is that this isn't about a polished, finished slide deck that says, just because I've taught this course before, I could just roll that same day book, course syllabus, slide deck out, and use it all again. I'm not the same. The content may have changed a little bit. And certainly, my learners are all different. So the journey has to take a little bit of a swerve. And on the journey, as I've long since learned, especially driving in the UK, mm, yeah, oh my gosh, it's like Montreal. You just close your eyes, grip the steering wheel, and hope for the best, right? But you've got to avoid roadblocks. You've got to be aware of some things. So today, I'm going to caution you about two roadblocks that we can slide into very easily. And the first one's called Yabbit. Are you familiar with Yabbit? <laughs> Yabbit's kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, no. My class has 50,000 students in it, right? Yeah, but I have no TAs. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. The minute we Yabbit, we've stopped thinking about doing anything differently. 
So it can be a roadblock to our thinking, not only about teaching, but definitely about assessment. And the other caution that I have for you is we tend to enjoy familiarity. So we go down those overly familiar routes because I know this is the fastest way to get to the parking lot before everybody else does. I can avoid the six mile line, right? But when we do that, we start to miss things. I don't know about you, but when I get really tired and I'm driving home, suddenly I'm in my driveway and I can't remember how I got there. Good thing the car did. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do the same thing when we're teaching. And yet, how many of us do? Because we've taught the same course. Because we know what's coming in week three, or week eight, or what they're going to be like when the assessments are due. But we need to just stop and think and talk. So the goal for today's journey, I have two. The first one is that I want you to leave with one new idea. Just one. It doesn't have to be fully formed. It's just a, hmm, hmm, that's something I think I might think about. And one thing that you're going to think about doing differently. So one new idea, one thing you're going to think about doing differently. So you heard a little bit about me, but you don't know who I am as a driver. <sighs> yeah. I'm the only one in my family that has not had a ticket. Now, that either says I don't drive enough or everybody else is crazy, but you get to choose. That's a multiple choice assessment, all right? But in terms of our journey around assessment, um, as you heard Nanda say, I've had 30 odd years in the public school system. I've taught all grades, even the grade 13. There are some of you in the room that would know what that is. My background is in science, so I've taught science, but I've also taught English, and I've taught geography, and I've taught math. And, um, but my background's in kin, but they don't teach kin in public school, so I had to you know, come up with some other things that I could teach. I've also had the pleasure and privilege of teaching both undergraduate and graduate students here at the University of Western Ontario. And um, I have learned some new tricks. Because in 1982, when I graduated from Teachers College and I took the Media Studies class, that was about knowing how to take my ditto and a razor blade and clean the back off so that when I used the Gestetner, the, the error wouldn't be repeated. So needless to say, the idea of technology and the idea that now I teach in Boston. I don't live in Boston. I live near Elmer. But all of my students are all around the world, and I connect with them through technology, which is an interesting way to think about assessment. Assessment across seven or eight different time zones can be quite interesting. I know you're going to have questions. I know that when 1015 comes, the sea of hands, forget the, forget the white spaces over here, the sea of hands is going to be incredible. And I want to ensure that I value what you want to say and what you want to share. But unless we're going to be here until after lunch, probably that's not physically possible. So instead, I've created a Padlet. Yeah, listen to this, the old dog, new tricks, woo! The Padlet is a tool that we use a lot in my courses. It's um, a way that you can post sticky note size questions or ideas. You can also link to text, graphic, websites, etc. So that's a QR code that links to a Padlet I've created specifically to ask questions. And part of my own constructivist perspective is that the wisdom is here in the room. I'm not the authority. We all have ideas that we can share and learn from. So on that Padlet, if you see a question that you think you could also have an answer to, there's space right underneath where you can respond. So you can have several people responding to the same question. So please, there's the link, there's the QR code, please use that. And I will also be hopping on after the talk today to respond to questions. So here's our trip itinerary. I'm a little bit more spontaneous. I kind of like, 
Okay, car, we're going here today. Oh, not to work, okay. But our itinerary this morning, we do a pre-trip pre check. When you have little children that everybody used the bathroom, right? When you're older, everybody used the bathroom, <laughs> okay. But we need to also think, what are our assumptions? With our own positionality, with our own epistemologies and ontologies, we are coming with ideas about assessment. Some of you were brave enough to put them up there on the wall. Some of you are still thinking, what on earth does she mean? Assessment means you hand it out and you collect it back and you grade it and you hand it back. But does it? Remember I said I was gonna say, oh, ooh, one new idea. So what are our assumptions? Then stop number one is the first conundrum. What do you do when what you thought you were teaching isn't what you're assessing? And oh my goodness, it looked like a good idea at the time and now I have all of these grades and I've spent all of this time, but it doesn't connect back to that outcome. What was I thinking? But the students all loved it. Number two, way too much data. I am going to spend every weekend between now and Christmas buried under paper. And conundrum number three, another paper, another paper, another paper, another paper, another paper, another paper, another paper. That's how your students are feeling. Little do they know, that's how we feel too, right? We're good at paper number one. By paper number four, we're not so good or lab report number four, again, again. So we're gonna be thinking about what happens when that assessment data is just too similar. And finally, we're never done. So even though this journey might be coming to an end at 10.30 this morning, I'm gonna plant some seeds for some new directions that I've discovered about assessment and I'll just foreshadow that I'm going to donate the book by Nielsen that talks about this new assessment technique, as well as a wonderful Canadian text by Tara Fenwick about assessment and evaluation to the CTL, so that you will have access to those resources by checking them out of the CTL. All right, so the pre-trip check, well, we see assessment for learning, assess, uh, authentic. See a bell curve. Did they get it? Now that's an interesting one, right? My dad swears he taught me how to whistle when I was five. Okay, so did he really teach me? What's our demonstration of teaching and learning? Do I have to whistle in order to demonstrate that he taught it? Or is my demonstration of learning that I can whistle? Hmm. Helping minority language speakers in the science classroom, content or language difficulty. Whoever wrote that is a woman or a man after my own heart because we have to think of diversity in the classroom and what does that look like and does one assessment fit all? We have calibration. Oh, peer, do you mean we trust the 22-year-olds to do assessment? <gasps> Say it isn't so. They can drive, they can vote, they can drink, but we won't let them tell us whether or not they think they did well on an assignment. Really? I trusted six-year-olds to tell me. What was the piece that you did well? Where do you think you need some help? We aren't gonna ask 19-year-olds those same kind of questions? Hmm, hmm, there's my hmm. Now, I can go so far and no further. That's as far as I can go. So if you wrote in the upper right-hand corner of this mural, you were smart, because that means I cannot read what you've written, but I'll catch up with you later. Why did we do that pre-trip check? Because every once in a while, we need to think about what we are thinking about, that metacognitive piece AKA critical thinking skills that we know from the degree learning outcomes. And we, we wrestle all the time about how do we teach critical thinking skills. Metacog is a, a, a higher order thinking skill. 
So having students write down on a recipe card, write down on a mural, what do you think about this when you come in? And then bring it back the next week and say, okay, how has your thinking changed based on what you've read, discussed, or learned in our class? Pre and post. It just looks different. It's also important that we check in with ourselves. Anything that can be seen, heard, demonstrated can be assessed. Anything. Seen, heard, demonstrated. Did you hear the word textbook in there? Did you hear the word online readings in there? No. Anything that can be seen, heard, demonstrated can be assessed. Also, when you look at some of the brave people that committed to our mural, you can see that their ideas privilege, and I use that privilege, not the word privilege, not in, not in a pejorative sense, but rather to say they put value there. They put value on student learning. Assessment for learning is putting value on the student's learning. When we're thinking about, oh my gosh, there's a thousand essays, how am I going to do this? Up, oh, Scantron! That's privileging our instructor self and our time management and our resources and personnel. Do you see? One's not right and one's not wrong. We just have to be aware of what are we privileging when we're thinking about assessment. Also, if we think about content mastery, if we think there is a canon in my subject and they must know the canon, done. Walls of concrete going from the floor to above the tower. Then we're privileging knowledge. And that also privileges a specific kind of learner. The ones who are very good at school. The ones who are very good as Nancy Ferguson in nursing. I'll never forget five years ago called it gulp and vomit. I can read the textbook and vomit it back out exactly the way that you told it to me. Okay? But is that the person that you want with you in the ER or in, in the operating theater or with your senior parent as we're trying to diagnose how to help them in end-of-life care? Hmm. So, pre-trip check. There's a lot of things we uncovered there. The other thing we've got to remember is when we're thinking about assessment, assessment actually goes all the way back to the Latin to sit beside, not stand in front of, not stand over, but to sit beside. And as we're going to discover here in a minute, assessment for learning is all about walking with the learner. So this is assessment with which we are very familiar. This permeates a lot of assessment practices from probably Thanks to EQAO, which is the standardized assessment here in Ontario for grade three, six, nine, and the secondary school graduation assessment, we become very familiar with this. Students are writing a test. Our role as the teacher, instructor, slash educator is to stand back, let them go. They hand it back to us. We tell them where they made the mistakes. Remediation? No. Feedback? Not usually. Grade? Absolutely. This is a static check on what has been learned, and it's summative. Usually, there's no follow-up to this. It's the end of the road. It's the final exam. But assessment for learning, as was written up here on our mural, talks about something a little bit different. An assessment for learning occurs during the learning process. We're checking in. Think of a supervisor in a lab. You're there. You're seeing it unfold. If there's going to be a mistake, you're intervening. And you're saying, just a second, before you do that, and there's a big boom, let's just step back and think. What have you done? Tell me the steps. Why are you doing that? If you do that, this is what's going to happen. How can we fix it? That's assessment for learning. The students have still learned, but they've done it in a way that's formative, in a way that they can use along the way. 
It's not about just measurement, but instead, it's not proof of learning, but a check-in. So, 1982 again, formative assessment. You are trying out a new recipe in, the, in your own kitchen with your family, who are very open with offering feedback. You serve a new recipe, mixed reviews. Needs a little bit more salt, oh, the garlic, ah, oh, this is awful. Was that parsley floating in there? As opposed to, I'm serving this when my boss and his family come for dinner. Summative, no chance to change anything. You'd better have gotten the recipe right in the early stages of the cooking. So, now that we've been doing some thinking about, hmm, what do I believe about assessment? What do I think that it can do? What do I think that it might not be able to do? We're stopping at our first conundrum. And Calvin, I think, captures it best here. Calvin, the dinosaur expert. Calvin, who wishes at school that the report card was written all about dinosaurs. So there's definitely a disconnect here because he knows a lot about dinosaurs. He's reading a lot about dinosaurs. He can talk about dinosaurs, but unfortunately, that's not what the report card was assessing. No dinosaurs in sight. Sometimes that happens in our courses as well. The magic triangle, learning outcomes. Oh my goodness, I can see some people cowering and putting their heads down on the tables. It's okay, this is just really brief. But I'm gonna remind everybody, if you don't know where you're pointing the car, you don't know when you've gotten there. And if you don't have that destination in mind, you can't articulate to your students where you're going either. So you need to think about what is it that I want students to know, be able to do and value by the end of our time together. That could be a class, that could be a course, that could be a program, that could be a degree. And notice what comes next. Not thinking of the fun stuff. Well, maybe you do. But it's not, oh, I can use the same textbook from two years ago. Thank goodness, because I don't know if there is a new edition. That would mean I would have to go back and restructure my slide deck. No. Instead, you think, what is the connection here? How am I going to know if they know? Over here, right, how do I know when they've learned it? Well. We better come up with some assessment strategies that are going to give us that kind of information. Could be a test, could be an exam. It could also be a virtual showcase, a brochure, a play, um, a musical piece. Remember, anything that can be heard, seen, or performed can be measured. I love this idea. And I'm old enough that it's happened. I've actually been invited to write a letter of reference for a kindergarten student who is applying to Schulich Med School. Okay? I know. Give me the hook. It's time to get out of here and let somebody else teach. I get it. I get it. But when they come back and tell you, wow, you know what I learned in your class? I learned it was OK to make mistakes. I still remember that great big DNA mo module that you had, or the way you'd come in and you'd rap at the beginning of all of the classes. I loved when you'd dress up. I loved how you tried to engage us, knowing that there was a lot of people in our class. Or remember when my mom died? You knew. And you took me for coffee, and we talked. So if they don't remember anything else about your course, have them remember this. So think of the this. What is the this you want them to remember? Is it a concept? I'll guarantee it's not going to be an equation. I'll guarantee it's not going to be something that they can Google. But what else is it? And now, what is your ideal way of assessing that? Ah. I heard it. I heard a yabbit. I heard it. I heard it. Watch for those roadblocks. The ideal way of assessing, think about that. Wouldn't it be great if we could? How about if? What if we take the other section together and go, hmm, 
dream, do some blue sky thinking, and then start coming back with the reality of, okay, could we pool our TAs? Do you think we could get a bus? Instead of, oh, my class is too big, oh, I don't have enough, oh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Because I guarantee that this piece will be the one that they remember. So I promised Dr. Ken that I would have some examples. Again, crash and burn Crocker examples, okay? Here's the way that we have to demonstrate what our learning outcomes are in our syllabus. Does this mean anything to you if you're a student? Not at all. But we have to have it there as our statements to say, this is where we're heading. This is what we want you to be able to do by the end of our course. What they want to see is something that looks more like this. Hmm. At this two-week module, this is the big question that we're going to be able to answer. And I have a, a propensity to try to frame things as questions. I just find them more open as opposed to just a noun. I always frame it as a question because that way it lets our students know that there's more than one answer and that's welcome. Or there's more than one way to arrive at that answer and that's welcome. So you can see the big, the big ideas. You can see where all of those outcomes are connected. And then it makes it much more transparent for them to be able to say, oh, so there's the assignments. Now I get it. And notice the assignment isn't exam, exam, test, presentation, mock trial, blah, blah, blah. They actually have names that resonate back with what the questions were so that the students can see how those connect to each other. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing before we went back. On the due dates, I want you to hold on to the word by, B-Y. Just park that in a space up here, okay? By. I'm coming back to it. This is a better way of showing students how the course content connects to assessments. This is the course that I have a privilege, the privilege of teaching at King's University. It's different from the outcomes and the course map that you just saw on the previous slide. But this is what I shared with students so that they would recognize there are the four chunks. Our, our 12 weeks together is divided into those four chunks. And you'll see that there's a number that corresponds over here. And there is the assessment task that relates to that chunk. So a mind map, a video or photo diary, community, community protocols, which were the research protocols before they went out and researched in the community and then came back and gave a storefront presentation. So there's variety in the tasks, which we'll be coming back to. But whenever you have a performance task like this, you also need to have something else. And I think it started with R. <laughs> and people think it looks like a chart. But as I'm going to dispel in a few minutes, don't always have to look like that. Okay, so hold on to that idea. Oh, what was that other word I asked you to hold on to? By. Good, just hold on. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Hold on to it. Now, time for a pit stop. You have a recipe card. I would like you to think about a course that you are teaching, a course you're not happy with, a course that you'd like to revise, a course that you're thinking, you know what? I just have to do something with this. Give, I'm giving you three minutes to just jot down a couple of ideas on that recipe card. Given what we've talked about so far, about alignment, pre predispositions toward assessment, maybe that word by, maybe that word rubric, who knows? I will call you back together by going three, two, one, and then we'll reconvene. Right? <laughs> ah, scary. <laughs> scary. <laughs> but our students think that's what we do. That's what's very scary. So I'm going to offer a few tips and tricks here in how to maximize your time. 
I'm not taking you down to the local bar and having you round up your friends, nor am I doing the standard stand at the top of the stairs and throw them down, and the one that lands, yeah, okay. Seriously, my friend Kim Holland is in the audience today, and I was so delighted that he came, because this first bullet point is courtesy of him. I don't give less written feedback. I give tons of feedback, but I record my feedback so that when I'm going through a paper and I'm looking at the R thing that we're gonna talk about in a minute, I can actually say, this is what I notice in your paper, this is what I notice on the rubric. Here are, th here are ways you can strengthen this paper, here's your next step, but here are the weaknesses that I'm seeing. And I'll tell you, does it save time? You bet. But moreover, I actually had a student come back and say, you were the first teacher that sat down with me and went over my work since grade nine in art class. They love to hear your voice. And even though you're not sitting down with them, virtually you are because they're going through their paper and listening to you. Oh, and by the way, where do you put the grade? At the end. They have to listen to the whole audio tape before they find out how they did. Cha-ching! We're gonna come back to rubrics here in just a minute because I wanna dispel the myth that rubric equals chart because it doesn't have to. I'm also going to suggest that there are ways in which you can use the same tool, whether that's a checklist, whether that's a marking score companion of some kind, for students assessing themselves and highlighting where their weaknesses are and where their strengths are prior to handing an assignment into you, you can then use that same tool and they have two sets of feedback now. And what does that do? That helps calibrate. And I noticed somebody put over there, calibrate. So is your A my A? Is your B my B? This way students know, am I aiming too high or too low? I'm not trying to guesstimate where the instructor or the faculty is, and instead I can say, okay, I get it, your B is my B, or oh, your B is actually my A, oops, better, better bump it up a bit, or yeah, I get it. Because if they aren't calibrating your feedback the same way you're intending, it's no wonder they're not getting it. Because if their very best work I'm, I'm talking their very best work. They slaved in the library, they did all the readings, they did everything they were supposed to, they handed in their best work, and their best is a B. If you're giving them feedback on how to get an A, they're not gonna get that, because to them, that was their best work. So you're highlighting things they can develop Strengths you see in the paper. What are the next steps? We're not saying, oh, if you want to bump it up from a B to an A or from a C to a B or from a 74.5792 to a 75.1726, here's what you need to do. Now, some folks in here know my love affair with recipe cards. Oh, well, who am I kidding? You all do. You all have one right there in your hand. $1.25 gives you 100 chances of having great fun. So, exit tickets. My students would come to expect that every once in a while there would be a recipe card on the, on the ends of the tables, and I would expect them to pick it up. They would never know during the lecture when I would be asking something on that recipe card, and then they would sign it, autograph it, put their answer on it, and send it down to the front or leave it at the door for me to pick on the way up. Two things that serves. Number one, I have automatic attendance, not who's signing in for who, but if I don't do the recipe card until an hour in, or maybe an hour and a half in to a three-hour lecture, hmm, I know who's there. Also, if they respond to, what's the big idea that we've talked about for the last hour just before we're on break? What's the thing that you remember? Boom, write it on the recipe card, send it down to the front. I know, have they got what I wanted them to learn? Think whistle. Have they got what I want them to know? 
because this is cumulative. And if they don't have this piece, we can't do the next piece. So I know right now, do I have to go back and reteach this? Or are we OK to go on with the next hour of work? The other thing, I always call it contribution to learning community. I don't call it participation. But if you've sent those down, I know who's here. I'm making a little mark in my gradebook that says, yep, thanks, Wendy. Thanks for the response. I know you were here, okay? as opposed to signing in on sheets. Just hmm, one way you can use those ubiquitous recipe cards. Performance products. And I know I see my friend from first year engineering sitting right in that third row, right there. Amazing, amazing performance products, right? Here are the criteria. He brings in the community. He has the students work in teams, not groups, teams. Teams are responsible to each other. Groups, I'm going home to do my chunk. Nobody else works as hard as I do. I'm submitting mine, and by the way, I'm going to text Wendy and tell her I did all the work. That's the difference between group and team. Team means you're establishing an ethos where they are just as committed to each other and the product as they are to getting their chunk done. I'm seeing, hmm, that's interesting. That's a hmm. So when do you establish teams? Class number one. You have some speed dating. You have an opportunity to meet other people in the room with a people bingo or something, something. And suddenly, you see little groups forming. And then you start to have teams where you meet with your teams within your lecture. <gasps> Gasp! Give over my lecture time for them to meet together? But when that happens, you're establishing a community. And soon they start to sit together, and they're interacting. And now we're ready to say, right, here's the project that's due after Christmas. This is what it looks like. Here are the pieces. I need a team leader for each one of these pieces. Now, now I have an individual mark for that person. How did they lead? What did the product look like? What was the, Right? So each of them has an individual mark. How does the product look collective against a rubric? Oh, now I have a group, like a whole total mark that everybody can get. And then, because they have been working together, self and peer. Did I contribute to the team in a way that helped us to recognize our product, our goal, etc.? And each other. Who really carried the weight? Who did a great job as team leader on their section? What could I have done better? Hmm, team versus group. And, st oh, what was that word again? Bye. Oh my gosh, staggered submission. Who would have thought it, right? Students love this because some of your students are incredibly organized. And if you say, I want that tomorrow, you'll have it tomorrow. Now, I know there's a wonderful workshop this afternoon about mental health. What's the price that we as instructors sometimes forget that puts on our students because we don't know the rest of the battles they're fighting, right? By tomorrow, and somebody doesn't hand it in, our automatic assumption is, our automatic assumption is, don't care, couldn't care less, right? Go, go to Mr. D's kind of marking, right? 30%, this is ridiculous. Yeah, but do you know that they're working three jobs? Or do you know that it wasn't possible to do that overnight tonight because I also had this, 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 and this? And family responsibilities, and? Or I can't get with my English tutor tonight in order to help translate what this assignment is really asking me to do. I can do the work. I just need help to frame it. So the by gives us permission to say, yeah, it's due th during this week by Friday. I start accepting them on Monday. What does that do to my workload? That means that I can mark some on Monday, some on Tuesday, some on Wednesday, some on Thursday, and some on Friday. So that I can sit with Mr. D on Saturday and laugh and say, no, I'm not marking your essays. So this is a. You'd know it a mile away. How did you know? It looks like a chart. So therefore, every rubric has to look like a chart, right? If it doesn't look like a chart, 
It's not a rubric. It's kind of like spot the Canada goose. If it's not pooping all over Western and doesn't have a brown throat or a beautiful photograph taken by my friend David, it's not a Canada goose. Yeah, I'm dispelling that myth. This is a analytic rubric. It's an analytic rubric because it analyzes the student performance according to a number of criteria. The criteria here have been created either by you or in the best case scenario with your students. And you say, what, would, what were the important aspects of this assignment? What would you be looking for if you were marking this assignment? They can come up with those ideas. So you contribute some, they contribute some, and then where do we start writing the criteria, the performance criteria, these pieces? What the performance looks like, that's the performance criteria. Where are we gonna start writing? If you think A, because if you do that, you've set the bar way too high because you already have Maya in mind, right? And she's the one that hands in better answers than yours. She's gonna be the only one that gets an A, remember? Yeah, no. If you said D as where you will accept the work at the lowest level of passing. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. At the lowest level of passing. Remember, a rubric is about performance, so I have to see it. If I don't see something, I can't assess it on a rubric. Therefore, it's not gonna get a D, it's gonna get a nothing. So what I'm seeing in the D column is the lowest level that I will accept that I can see, that's a pass. If you said that, sorry. Well, that only leaves two. Go ahead, where are we starting? Hold on to that idea. I'm going to suggest that we start at B because B is usually your standard, right? B is the place that 70 to 79. That's where a lot of our students, that's, that's kind of the performance that we expect to see from our students. So we create what does the B look like? Once we've created what the B looks like, now we hop down to the D. And we say, all right, if this is our standard, what's the lowest level that we're going to accept? And tell me again your wording of the column. Um, not acceptable. Not acceptable. But not acceptable because... Okay, post it on our Padlet, because this is interesting. So when you look at this, it's all about description. It's all about students being able to see this in advance and know what it is they have to create, right? Under expectation. Okay, but uh, my under expect, oh, oh, that's a tricky one. Because if we're saying that B is a standard, then that would intimate that C and D are under expectation, right? And remember the student that wants to do a really good job for you, so they're gonna stay up all night long? Where's their expectation? A, right? That would mean that D, C, and B are all under expectation. So we have to be able to see this. It has to be able to be demonstrated. They have a, an idea of how that's been described and what it is that you're expecting. We've gone from creating B to D. Now, where are we going to go? Don't say A. Don't say A. Now we're going to bridge it. We're going to create, okay, what's the bridge look like between D and B? What's the next step up from D? So you create your C, and then finally, we look at the A. But most importantly, A is not a high jump. It's certainly not a pole vault. It's the next logical step up a ladder. So when you read across, according to the criteria, this should describe now what the performance would look like starting with the lowest performance that you will accept as a pass. 
So rarely makes connections among concepts with the big, oh, see, there's that wording, big ideas. Remember that was in the syllabus? This two-week module, the big idea we're exploring is, okay? Over here, sometimes, often. Oh, and by the way, did you also notice there's no quantification in here? I haven't said makes five big ideas, makes seven connections, makes 12 connections. That's when you get really surface level things because they're busy counting, right? Think about the depth of the connections, that critical thinking, the metacognitive piece. That's what you're going for. So when you read across, that will give you a sense of the trajectory of that criteria. You, the analysis part of this is because you say, oh, Wendy, yeah, well done on the connections. You're at the standard. Depth of reflection, yeah, you're at the standard. Critical insights, hmm, you made a point I hadn't thought about. Up here for that one, okay. Does that mean she is going to receive an A on this assignment? Thumbs up if you think she is. Thumbs down if you think she's not. Exactly. So far, I've seen two Bs and one A. Am I, oh, by the way, have I gotten my calculator out yet? Am I going, oh, 4 plus 4, mm, 8 plus 5, oh my goodness, times whatever, what's this out of again? What's the weighting? Uh, no. B, B, A, critical insights, mm, relationship between the view of the child, ah, eh, that was okay. You did a good job. Selection and use of the presentation tool, kicked it out of the park, another A. Overall impression, professional presentation, polished and professional. More Bs than As, without even having to go to a calculator, what is the bucket that this is gonna fall into? B. Okay, that's how you use an analytic rubric. Waiting. Gosh, we have spent so much time on making text-to-text, text-to-self, text-to-world connections. It's going to count double this time. So it does. So it counts B, 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 because that's what you got. B, A, B, B, A, B. So I waited it on the critical reflection. She's still getting a... B, did you have to drag your calculators out for that? No, that's how you use an analytic rubric, okay? It does save time when you use them in that way. Now, oh boy, the Padlet is gonna be full of questions. Single point rubric. I am not trying to describe all of the performances from D to C to B to A. Instead, I'm telling you what the performance looks like at the standard. This rubric is a really powerful one because it encourages student reflection and my assessment on the same tool. So if a student was handing in, um, I would have them every three weeks reflect on how was your work on the discussion board. Students on the online programs, discussion board is like that oh, do I have to put my hand up in class? That's the equation, right? So I'm looking for these things at a B level. Students hand in a self-reflection. I don't open it. I use that same tool. I assess it, and I send both of them back to the student, and the student does the comparison, and then the student tells me the one thing they're going to do in the next three weeks that's different from what I've already seen powerful stuff. If it's only, if, if I'm not seeing anything above competent, then I just highlight competent. If there was something that they did, perhaps they created a chart or a graph or some kind of a visual, then I'm going to put that in superior for that idea because that was beyond my expectation and they're going to see that. So when the student opens up their reflection and my assessment and puts them side by side, what do you predict they're going to be doing more of in the next three weeks? More multimodal responses, right? Told you I was going to dispel everything you thought you knew about rubrics. So now, pick up your recipe cards, please. And you are going to meet with two other people that have two other colors of recipe card other than yours. 
So if you are yellow, you're looking for a green and a blue. If you're a blue, you're looking for a yellow and a green. We're going to have about six minutes, and I want you to talk to each other about what are some of the ways that you maximize your time while still offering important and robust feedback to students. Questions about the task? All right, up we go. Time to move around, find your group. I really appreciate the ideas and the sharing across disciplines. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but there's times when my home office looks kind of like this, with student papers. And I think, oh my goodness, did they just all sit together? Did they all just, they got a group buy at Staples and everybody put them in the same cover? <laughs> but you know something? Sometimes we ask for our assessment tasks to be too similar. So they will get the course outline from the course you taught last year. Not necessarily the work, but the course outline. And what do you think they've been doing this summer? Hanging around on the beach? Down at the seeps? No, they've already been preparing what they know you're going to ask for. All right? So we need to change that up a little bit. So rather than having assessment tasks that are predictable from year to year, predictable from course to course, I challenge you to rethink the paper. Now, for those of us in arts, humanities, and education, I am certainly not suggesting there isn't a reason for having students write papers. If we're demonstrating sustained thinking or sustained presentation of an argument, that's the way you have to do it. But there are other formats that we could potentially use that demonstrate those same criteria just in a different genre or in a different format. Like what you're thinking? Well, how about this? Just for starters. All right, and seriously, this is a hyperlinked list that I've trolled through from this site. So when these slides become available to you, I encourage you to go through and have a look. Book reviews, case studies for business, but a case study outlining a critical incident that is different than that. Demonstrations of competence in professional practice settings, i.e. practice teaching i.e. suturing, i.e. what are we doing in the nursing profession today? Perhaps taking a history. Let's listen to you do that and score it on a rubric instead of fill in the blank or short answers. We've got literature reviews. We've got annotated bibliographies. We've got creating a website. We've got wikis. We've got a class blog. We've got pulling together people's ideas and putting them together as a compendium or an anthology. And the list continues. The text that I referred to earlier that's an absolute gem on my bookshelf is also one, this is one of the two that I'm gifting to the CTL. It's Canadian, which is an added bonus. So the milieu and the context for looking at assessment in higher education is one that's transferable to us here at Western. Fenwick and Parsons talk about something called dynamic assessment. And all that means is instead of putting the onus, the marks, if you will, on the product, we're also looking at the process. So here are some examples from their text of what we mean by dynamic assessment. So instructors creating all the evaluative tasks. This is my favorite one. It's hard work putting a course together. It is hard work creating the assessment tasks and the rubrics that will accompany those. So why don't we invite students to help with the design of some of those products and some of those assessment tasks? So therefore, as a culmination, we can see what it is that they've learned. Remember that if I see you in five years, I want to know what was important to you. That gives us an opportunity to see if what we thought was important is what was important to them. We see uh, learners completing a series of tasks individually and competitively. 
as opposed to, there's that word, small teams. They reflect on and assess their contribution, the work of the group, and the quality of the product. So as the instructor, you can actually get five different assessment measures from that one task. You've got the final group product. You've got how the team worked together. You have the individual scores for the team leaders. You have their self-reflection and the peer reflection. Five assessment points. Now, I know you're sitting with your friends. And if I was a huge statistician, I would also suggest the probability that three cards in a row would be pretty good, of the same color. When you head back to your faculties later this week, I encourage you to sit together and think about what are some of the assessment tasks that you do in your course? What are some of the things that we perhaps overdo within our program? And are there ways that we can change that up a little bit? Because sometimes, remember along a journey, it's good just to sit and think, talk to somebody else, get some new ideas, revamp your own ideas, say, hey, could we do that together? Remember, sometimes the load shared is the load halved. When you team teach, when you even team teach an assessment task, you have another set of eyes. You have another brain helping you put that rubric together. You have another person saying, ooh, this could potentially be a roadblock. It could be a yabbit. Watch out for those. I said that before we ended today, I would suggest to you a new some new thinking around assessment. And this is something that I'm puddling in. And it's also the other text that I will be leaving at the CTL with my very best wishes. It's called Specification Assessment. And Nielsen has done other textbooks about teaching in higher education. So she's coming from a place, yes, in the United States, but a place where she knows of which she speaks. She's suggesting the use of specification assessment in the creation of bundles of assessment tasks. Okay, I know, bear with me for a minute, because this really is different. So you create a bundle of tasks that represent the A. You create a bundle of tasks, some of which might come from the A, but others that represent B. You create a bundle of tasks, some from the B, new ones for the C, that represents the C grade. The D grade is going to be one or two of the assessment tasks that you've already created. So the number of assessment tasks decreases as you go from A to D, but the student chooses which bundle they are pursuing. So not everybody is doing everything. And they know from the outset that even if I chose a B bundle, the best I can do is a B. In order to get an A, I have to be doing the tasks from the A bundle. And those aren't all exams, uh, tests, quizzes. They can be field projects. They can be portfolio assessments. They can be all of those other kinds of performance tasks in addition to exams. But usually your D is the midterm and the exam. C is beefing it up from there. B is beefing it up from there. A is beefing it up from there. And notice, they, they choose and complete the bundle at a satisfactory level. So once you determine what is satisfactory, that's a plus, that's a pass fail. I'm working in the B bundle. What does satisfactory look like? It either is satisfactory or it's not satisfactory. And then she goes on to talk about the assignment of plus and minus grades. So a B plus would be calculated by adding those contribution to the learning community or participation points. That's how you add on to your score. Now, if you're thinking, hmm, that's an idea I want to learn more about. More information can be found at these websites. If you're someone that's working in history and government studies, 
uh, the Wilkersite.org spells it out specifically about how he applies it to his courses. Math and computer science, more science-based courses, it's the, it's the bottom reference. Recapping. We've talked about a lot in an hour, and you've done a lot of work. We've talked about assumptions that we have to think about before we do any kind of assessment because it's about our biases, our beliefs, where do we privilege our assessment. Stop number one, conundrum number one, was considering that teaching and learning alignment, the magic triangle, because you will never fix in assessment what you didn't think about in your teaching design. You can't go backwards. The second stop was strategies to still have robust, meaningful assessment for learners, but not spending every weekend under a mountain of paper. Think Mr. D. There were some interesting truths there. Stop number three that I've just shared with you was changing up your assessment plan. My father was a principal for 32 years and always said, if we always do what we've always done, we always get what we've always got. If you love spending your weekends under a mountain, never mind, need stay no more. And then staying current. We're back on the road, maybe thinking about specification assessment. Every good trip has lots of memories. Every good trip has a plethora of photographs. Every good trip has that one or two takeaways. And I remind you that the goal for today's journey was one thing that made you go, hmm, one thing that you think you're going to try. So on your recipe card, you might want to circle those before you kind of lose it and leave to get ready for the next session. But I know my journey is not yet finished, so thanks for coming along on this one, and don't forget to post questions to the Padlet. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. We have time for some questions. Uh, Ken's going to be running around at the back of the room, and I'm at the front. So any questions for Dr. Crocker? <laughs> Ken? Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question regarding the specification assessment. It's a great idea, especially in terms of differentiated instruction. like. I like the idea of specification assessment because it matches with differentiated instruction where students get like catering for the students. But I have one concern, which is if we have, like, once we lose specific skills, like if students stick to the midterm and the test, let's say, we want to ensure that they get the other skills that we want them to get from the course. What do you think about this? Great question, thank you. So it was about the specification assessment, although it does help with differentiation because the students are making the choices about which bundle they're gonna pursue. The question was about how do we ensure that we still have the developing skills and those are being demonstrated by the students. That's what's going to take time. That's what I'm still puddling around with to be very honest with you about this because the bundles the meat, if you will, the performance tasks, the what you want the students to know and be able to do, still has to be consistent across those grade bundles, right? So what you are asking the students to do and how you've created those tasks still needs to be robust. So we are not dumbing it down as we slide down the bundles, okay? So the, the content and the outcomes, if you will, and the skills that we're wanting to see demonstrated are still robust, they're being demonstrated in a different way. And you'll also notice, not across such a spectrum of performance tasks or as many things do, right? Because the number of tasks that's required decreases across the bundles. I really encourage you to have a look at some of those sites that I had up on the slides that investigate the specification assessment a little bit more deeply. It really has captured my imagination. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Other questions? Take this one here. Oh, perfect. Okay, so in, it's, uh, on Twitter, Pauline has posted an example from Western about specification assessment. So thank you, thank you, thank you for posting that real world example from right here at UWO. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I've taken uh, many ideas from this session, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, one question I have for you is that um, I, I teach a class in professional development, and I don't mark those students. No. Okay. Um, so you've given me some ideas on how to make sure that they are actually getting it. Um, but I, I want to know how many concepts can I present in a two-year class, or two-hour class, mm -hmm. that two, three? Three. OK. The, the magic number is three. Now, when I'm surrounded by psychologists who know much more than a kinesiologist in that regard, yep. um, it's just that's, that's the kind of the rule of teaching, whether or not it was with high school students or higher education, you don't want to go beyond three big ideas. Okay. And you can unpack those and repack them and come at them sideways and get them to show them, but it's usually three. Okay. Any more than that, and it gets really cloudy. Okay, thank you. Awesome question. Ken? Assignments, and we've asked the students to do a research paper. Oh my gosh, not another paper I have to write. So <laughs> how do we as instructors make that really, really interesting for the students to actually do? Okay, say it one more time. Well, here's, here's the notion. We, we're handing out another assignment. It's a research paper. 25% of your grade. Do some homework. Talk about stuff that's really common sense. And yeah, we don't want to talk about this anyway, but you have to do it as part of the course. Okay. All right. Ethics, specifically. Okay. How do we make that really, really interesting that students actually want to do? Oh, my gosh. Start with them. What is it that they are thinking about right now? What's in the news that's making them go, oh, my gosh, can you believe so-and-so did this? Like, needless to say, T south of the border would be an entire course in and of himself. <laughs> but if they could bring in some ideas, right, what's happening right now in Hong Kong? What are the ethics that are implicit in that? What's the social justice piece of that? So bring it from the real world, as Kolb would say, bring it from our experiential learning back into the reflection and then have them write about it. Right over here. My colleague who should be giving this presentation, <laughs> but is giving a workshop this afternoon. So I wanted your thoughts on something, Wendy, and this seems like an easier way than coffee, right? So um, <laughs> when you're talking about the constructive alignment, I used to put it in my syllabus to show students. Yep. This year I'm moving to this passport system where I want them to tell me when they've learned it. Because I awesome. want to see if what I'm thinking in my head matches up with what they're doing. I also want to give them wiggle room to say that not everyone's going to get there at the same right. time, and that's okay. So I just wanted your love thoughts it. about, and this is at a fourth year level. I would not do that at a yeah. first year level. No, love it. Again, it's going back to that metacognitive piece, right? That said, okay, we've learned this, we've learned this, we've learned this within the structure of our classroom, so what? Let's go back to what the outcome said we were going to be learning. Where do you see that threading back through? And you know what? They might make connections that you didn't think about. Right? Yeah, awesome. What a great strategy. Love it. Thank you for sharing.